Hi friends, I'm really excited to talk to you about today's topic, which is meerkats. Hi friends, uh, today's topic is going to be meerkats and I'm really excited about this one because I know some of you are very interested in them and you requested that we cover this. So without anything further, here we go. We're going to go through our usual agenda today. We'll do a brief introduction. We'll talk about the origins of meerkats. We will give some meerkat facts about their lives, their behavior, their diets, and then we'll go through our activities and our resources. So as an introduction, you guys know me, but I'm Megan, I'm Aiden and Lizzie's mom, and I work at scientist.com. So I have a background in science and I really love to learn and I love to teach. So that's why we're having this discussion today. And you guys might be wondering why these meerkats look so confused, and it's probably because they're out of school right now. Uh, and you guys are out of school, but your moms and dads are still trying to get a lot of work done. I know we've been really busy at scientist.com lately, so I bet your moms and dads are super rushed and busy too. So trying to help out a little bit and still get you guys an education by teaching you some really fun STEM topics. So today we're going to be talking about meerkats and we're going to talk about their origins first. You might remember this from one of our earlier lessons and this guy in the picture is Charles Darwin. He is a famous naturalist and he's from England and it took him about 20 years to write this really cool book called The Origin of Species and it actually explained the process of evolution. The basics of that are that no two animals are the same, even if they belong to the same species. So animals and plants also compete to survive. And if they didn't, the earth would just be covered by the offspring of one pair of animals. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So because of this competition, little changes happen within the species. And those add up and over time can create a whole new species. And by over time, I mean over thousands or millions of years. So it's hard to see evolution happening with our own eyes, but we're pretty sure it's actually happening. So you might remember this picture too. This is part of evolution uh, in the theory, and it's called the tree of life. And so basically what that means is that there's a lot of variation between all these different species. And even, be even though that's the case, we're all coming from one originator or one ancestor. And that's, that was like some single-celled organism millions and millions and millions of years ago. So you can see in this picture that that tree of life has branched out into a bunch of different areas. There are fish and sharks and mammals and snails and insects and bacteria and viruses and all these different things that have branched off of that tree. But I wanna show you the branch that meerkats are hanging out on. So in the kingdom of Animalia or the animal branch, there's the phylum called chordata, and that just means that they have a notochord during development or they end up having a spinal cord later in life. The class that they're in is called mammalia, which means they're mammals. So they have fur or they produce milk for their babies and they probably have live young. So that means that they don't lay an egg. They also are in the order carnivora, which means that they can consume meat, which might be a fact that you didn't know about meerkats. Can you go turn that off, please? I don't know how. Flip the button down. So the other interesting thing about meerkats is that they're in the suborder Feliformia. And Fili might sound familiar to you, or Felis, because it sounds like cats, right? And they actually are kind of related to cats. Then their family is Herpestidae, and that family includes interesting things like mongooses. So you can see here, uh, I've showed you guys this picture before, but the branch that the uh, meerkats are coming off of has the yellow here, and it's Herpestidae. And you see it's actually really close to the Canidae, which is the canines we talked about in a previous lesson. Another close relative of meerkats um, in the uh, Filiformia subfamily um, are the Felidae, so that includes house cats and big cats like lions and tigers. And then it also includes uh, mongooses. So you can see the Herpestidae is a family mainly of mongooses, but with some meerkats thrown in. And if you get down and zoom in even more on that tree of life, you'll see the uh, surrogates right here, 
the mon or the meerkats, but they're right next to Mungos Mungo, which is actually uh, the mongoose. And these pictures are a banded mongoose. And you can see they look pretty similar to meerkats. If you zoom in uh, or zoom out on this tree of life, you can see how everything is related. And I wanted to show you this cool website that I found. It's called One Zoom. Uh, One Zoom. And I'm going to go to it now. So if you go to this home page, you can either kind of click around and explore. You can pick a popular place to start exploring, or you can click this Start Explore button. And when you click that button, you can go ahead and search for a certain animal on the tree of life. But what I'm going to do right now is press this next button for Advanced Search or Tracer. And what that does is it allows you to pick a path between two different animals to review. So we're going to start with meerkat here. Click on that and suricata, suricata. And I want to trace a path to something that I know is a relative. Remember how we saw the canines. So I'm going to put in Canada. And while I'm doing that, you can see it zooming in on its tiny little branch on the tree of life. And there's the meerkat. You can get a bunch of interesting information about it there. And then we'll go to the canines. And now it's gonna trace a path for us. So it's gonna zoom back out and show where they meet up. So you can see the mongoose is purple and meerkat. And then the dogs, wolves, foxes, and more in the Canadae are pink. And these go both come together in the carni carnivorans. So they're both carnivores. And then zooming out even further, you can see some of these other branches and going back into uh, all the other relatives that they have, and you can find how long ago uh, nearest ancestors were and things. So I'm gonna keep zooming out here and show you, it's also going back in time. So these are millions of years ago. And then you can go down to the big single branch eventually of all life on the tree of life. So this is a fun tool for you guys to play around with and compare different species. And if you want to do that for part of your homework, you certainly can. So next, we're going to talk all about meerkats. So the meerkat, or Suricata suricata, is actually just a small mongoose. So I showed you before that they're very closely related to mongooses, and you can see here that they look like that picture I showed you before, right? So they're just kind of like itty-bitty mongooses. And physically, they're very small and slim or skinny in their build, but they have kind of a wide head and big eyes and a pointy snout. They've got long legs and a thin tail, and you can see they're pretty small animals. I picked this silly picture of the mongoose resting, or the meerkat resting on this photographer's zoom lens to show you relative size, or size in comparison to a person. And you can also see there in the uh, gray kind of shadow picture how small a mongoose is compared to a grown-up who's standing. So they're about 24 to 35 centimeters, or uh, nine and a half to about 14 inches, uh, so a little over a foot tall. And then they usually weigh uh, between half a kilo and a full kilo. So they're about one and a half to two pounds. So they're actually pretty small animals. If you think about it, like a regular house cat that you might have is probably eight to 10 pounds for a smaller house cat, sometimes up to 20 if they're kind of big and chunky. But meerkats are a, quite a bit smaller, around two pounds. So maybe the size of like a rabbit that you would see. And one of the interesting things about meerkats is that uh, there's not a lot of difference in size between the males and the females. In some animals, uh, there can be a very great difference in how big uh, the boys and the girls get, but in meerkats, they're about the same. They also have a really uh, soft coat that is light gray or yellowish brown, although individuals that live in the more southern parts of their region can be quite a bit darker. And they have uh, those kind of outer hairs, the guard hairs that keep, uh, help water run off their backs and help keep kind of dirt away from their skin. Those are light at the base and then have different rings around them. And that's what creates this pattern that you see on their fryer. So the bands on them are not like traditional stripes that we would say like you would see on maybe a raccoon's tail or on a bumblebee but they're not, they're kind of broken up. So they're not truly defined stripes. They're more like broken bands. And the hairs uh, that kind of line up in a certain way create those bands for us. And then you can also see that their eyes are pretty big in relation to the, the size of their head. And it's about 20% of their skull is taken up um, by their eye sockets. So I thought that was very interesting. 
they also, because they're carnivores, have pretty sharp teeth. And you can see here, they actually have about 36 teeth, and you can see there's some pretty sharp canines on there. And that's because uh, they need to be adapted for the food that they're eating. And as carnivores, just like dogs or cats, they have to have sharp teeth for tearing into prey. And they're also well adapted, besides just their teeth, but they're well adapted for digging. So they dig to get at the food that they want, but also to dig their burrows and tunnel system. And they have kind of big, sharp, long, curved foreclaws. And foreclaws are just the claws that are on the front, the front arms or front feet. So that allows them to dig really efficiently and quickly uh, to build their burrows and to get at food. And then the claws on their back feet aren't quite as long, but they use the, their back feet and then their tails for balance while they're standing up. And I'm gonna show you in a little bit why meerkats stand up so much. But one of their other interesting physical characteristics is that they're good at thermoregulation. And thermo means heat, and regulation just means to keep something kind of steady, at a steady state. So they're really good at controlling the heat in their body. As you can imagine, uh, they live in some pretty warm places and we see meerkats hanging out kind of in the sandy desert looking areas. So they could get really hot, but what they do is that they keep their body to a certain kind of rhythm of temperature. So they let their body warm up a little in the day and then cool down more at night. And they keep their metabolism or the kind of energy, the engine of their body, they can slow down their engine at night. And so their temperatures actually go down. And then sometimes in the morning, they want to come out and maybe warm up and get going for the day. So a lot of times they will generate heat by sunbathing. And so this silly guy right here is doing exactly what it looks like. He's just laying back and enjoying the sunshine and warming himself up. Now meerkats uh, also live in uh, some groups and they have families. So you can see here there's like some little meerkat babies and females or the mothers usually have one to eight babies at, the at a time. Um, or they can have one to eight babies, but usually they have three to four. And the babies are called pups and they're actually born underground in the burrows that the meerkats dig. And that way they're safe from predators. And when they're born, they're really, really small. They're about an ounce. And you can see uh, the zookeeper here is holding three baby meerkats next to each other in, in their hands. So they're, you can see how small they are compared to people. And in addition to being really tiny, they're actually blind and deaf and don't really have a lot of hair when they're born. So they need to be taken care of by their mother, but also their father and siblings kind of pitch in to help. So the whole family helps take care of the babies. And the pups will stay um, in the burrow and drink their mom's milk for about nine weeks. And then they're kind of ready to start exploring, but they don't go off on their own until they're about a year and a half old. And then after that, they can live up to eight years in the wild, in the desert. But in zoos, because they're safe from predators and things and receive medical care, uh, they can live for up to 13 years. So if the meerkat isn't in the zoo, you might wonder where it is. And they're actually found in Africa. So I have a world map here with the continent of Africa and a little red spot here. And then if you zoom in on Africa, you can see where the meerkats occur. And so a range is just um, an area of the world where you might be able to find this species and where they live. And so for meerkats, that's Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa, and then a little bit of Angola, uh, just up in the corner there. So you're likely to find uh, meerkats down in the south part of Africa, which means that it's pretty dry and arid habitat. And arid is just another word for dry. So they like to live in these areas that have kind of stony or rocky ground and they're open habitats. So what that means is that there's not a lot of trees or other plants that are hanging out on the ground that would block their vision. So because they're in dry, wide open places, they can see for a pretty long distance. So they like hanging out by dry riverbeds um, or things like that where there's not a lot of rainfall every year. So under like two feet of rain. And they actually um, use some of this area to scope for predators. So if there's not a lot of rainfall and there's not a lot of vegetation or plants or food, there's not a lot of competition in these areas. So the meerkats can kind of dominate um, that zone. And they also uh, use these areas to kind of keep an eye out for predators and things. And that's why they like these open parts. 
because if there's trees and things around, that's a good place for predators to hide. So they're also very social animals and they can form pretty big packs of up to 20 meerkats. And there's usually about half uh, males and half females or half boys and girls in the pack. And then there's lots of pairs and little babies and things like that. And in these packs, they actually take turns doing different jobs. So some of them uh, might spend the day looking after the pups or the babies and some might spend the day looking out for predators. And they're usually pretty cooperative with each other and they divide labor uh, or divide up their work or chores uh, amongst each other. And they're not super strict about it like maybe bees are or ants, but they do have a pretty clear uh, distinction between some of the different types of activities that they do. So for example, if an older meerkat has a lot of status or is very important in the group, uh, they might do uh, a little bit less care for the pups and a little bit more sunbathing or enjoying themselves than other ones. And when they're doing these things like caring for pups or sunbathing, they're not watching for predators. So what happens is that there is a member or a couple members of the pack that are in charge of keeping everyone safe and they're called sentinels. So because they like to live in these kind of rocky crevices or uh, dips and they have all these burrows and things, they will make themselves um, some, something basically to stand on, like a platform. It's kind of like a lookout post. And one, of, one or more of the meerkats will hang out on these lookout posts and they'll do what these meerkats are doing here, which is standing up and scanning the horizon. And when they do that, they are looking for predators or they're looking for, you know, basically anything that could threaten or harm the pack. And they can use their voices to call to the other meerkats to tell them about what they see and to warn them. So they might need to tell the, the pack to shift into another burrow, or they might need to tell them to hide, or they might need to tell them to all come and fight uh, something that's dangerous. So for example, if there's a snake, uh, sometimes the meerkats will do what's called mobbing, which a mob is like a big group of them that comes and they all chitter and yell at the snake and try to scare it away. So there's different behaviors um, and things that they do depending on the situation and depending on what the meerkat that is the sentinel tells them is going on. And I'm going to give you an example here of meerkats talking to each other. So when they're on sentinel duty, they have to tell each other different things. And you might remember from some of our classes before we showed these uh, kind of visual representations of sounds. So it's basically using our eyes to see what uh, the, the waves that make up a sound look like. And you can see these are a little bit different and they might not sound super different to humans because they're not our language, but they are very different. And you can see this one means aerial danger. So danger from the sky, like a bird of prey. And this one means terrestrial or ground-based danger. So something like a coyote or a wolf is coming for them. And the meerkats have these different calls because it means that the other meerkats in the uh, pack will know exactly what to do when they hear that noise. And they might have calls for uh, predators, but also for time to take care of the babies, or we're going to dig together, or we're going to sunbathe. So they have all these different basically meerkat words that they can use. And I'm going to show you guys um, an example of what a meerkat sounds like. And I bet nobody would have expected this, but here are some meerkat noises. So I thought that was really surprising because to me, it almost sounds like an angry squirrel. And the, I'm not sure exactly what that sound means in meerkat speak. But you can tell that they kind of sound like they look, right? Like there's a, brrr, a couple different sounds that are rolled together in there. And I think that was really interesting. So I'm guessing that was probably some alarm call of some sort. So meerkats can also call to tell the other meerkats that there is food or something nearby. And meerkats usually are insectivores, which means they mostly eat insects like beetles but they can also feed on a lot of other things. They might eat eggs, they might eat amphibians like frogs, they might eat arthropods, including scorpions, um, or even reptiles and small birds, but they'll also eat like plants and seeds and things. So you can see from these pictures, there's quite a wide range of things that they're eating. Um, up in this corner, we have a grown-up meerkat snacking on a lizard. 
Got someone having a millipede here. Looks like a beetle in this guy's mouth. And then this one's having a pomegranate and maybe an apple, so it might be in a zoo. But then look at this little baby up here. This is just a little tiny meerkat, not all the way grown, and it's got a scorpion in its mouth. So what do you think would happen to us if we got stung by a scorpion? It would hurt a lot, right? Because they have venom. And actually, the meerkat can eat the scorpion because it's immune uh, to the venom, which means that it can't get sick from it. So something special about the meerkat's body just doesn't react to this venom at all. So they don't get sick. They don't um, feel pain from it or have it swell up or anything. I mean, besides from the actual stinging that happens itself. But so they will actually go ahead and eat, or eat uh, these scorpions, even the little babies. And they've also been seen eating things like desert truffles. So if you remember from our pig episode, uh, some of the pigs were truffle hogs, which means they go and look for these mushrooms basically in the forest. And uh, meerkats will basically eat desert mushrooms, which I thought was really interesting. And they spend about five to eight hours of their day doing what's called foraging or looking around for food. And they hang out in a pack while they do that. And so while they're in that pack, some are foraging and some are caring for the babies and some are on lookout duty. But one of the interesting things is that they vary where they're feeding each day. So they move to a new area each time and they try not to come back uh, for at least a week. And that means that their food supply is kind of replenished or they get like a refill of food in that area from mother nature. So that way they're not eating just everything in that space every day and then it doesn't recover and can't feed them anymore. So it's actually pretty impressive. And when they're foraging out there, they're looking for you know, plants and seeds and things, but they're also turning over stones and digging around to find those things like lizards and scorpions. And they'll actually chase them for a short distance if they need to, to get at them. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk through our activities for the day. Uh, today, little kids have something kind of new. You can either draw your own meerkat or you can complete one of these pages that I have linked to in the description. So the, there's a meerkat maze and a meerkat coloring page. For big kids, you can do a couple different things as well. You can create a tree of life on the one zoom tool I showed you and explore the path between meerkats and then whatever your favorite animal is. And then please share that with me because I'd love to see. You can make a comic about meerkat behavior or you can write a couple sentences about how they vocalize. For middle schoolers, you can uh, create the tree of life on one Zoom, but explore a path between meerkats and at least three other animals we've discussed in class. You can screenshot that and share it with me too, because I'm really interested to see. You can draw and label a meerkat habitat, or you can create a comic about meerkat vocalization. And then finally, for extra credit, you can send me a video of you doing your best meerkat impression with vocalization. So I wanna hear your meerkat noises and see if you're a sentinel or if you're taking care of babies or what your meerkat job is. And then of course, you can email your homework to me and I will put you in the drawing to win a $10 Amazon gift card uh, sponsored by my company, scientist.com. Well, my company that I work for. It's pretty great of them to do the sponsorship, and I know you guys have really been excited about winning so far. And there's a lot more resources available to you if you're interested in looking further into meerkats. I have some links for you here. A lot of them are uh, kind of kid-based links, but then there's an interesting paper as well um, about molecular phylogeny of the Herpesidae. So you can go ahead and check that out if you're an adult. And then there's a link to the OneZoom uh, at the end. So that is all I have for you today. I really appreciate you joining and it was great to teach you about meerkats. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next week. Bye.